some hard times. She had the cojones to come to Anne and ask her to give up her relationship with Lou since she had already had a baby by him. So basically it was like, oh, well, he gave you a baby. You need to move on. Which kind of just blows my mind. Hmm. She, uh, I'm assuming that she turned her down and uh, Anne was able to keep track of the affair by listening to Marie's conversations with her mother over the phone. Oh, because she knew the language. She knew, oh. yeah, she knew Mandarin. So oh she my knew gosh. Everything they were saying. Uh, apparently, uh, the girl had a conversation with her mother about contraception. So, TMI. Oh my gosh. Nonetheless, uh, Anne eventually reunited with Lou both romantically and professionally. Together, they designed the Trenton Bathhouse in Trenton, New Jersey. Oh. Which is a really unassuming concrete block structure. Yep. Uh, he, I think he'd begun it before she returned to the office, but then when she came back in, she kind of put her signature on it by revamping the floor plan and adding the hipped roofs, because I think originally he had built it with no roof at all. In an interview for the documentary, Anne claims that this building was the first real example of Kahn's new design philosophy. Anne and Lou would continue their liaison until 1957, uh, possibly 1958, their daughter Alexandra was three when Lou broke it off. They continued to work professionally until 1964 when they had a falling out and Anne left the firm. By then she was a partner, so that must have been a blow to her, I think. Um, not only to... Well, they clearly had a good working professional relationship, um, so to lose that and her partnership would have not have been cool at all. She would never marry, but she would go on to design some interesting houses and buildings herself. So maybe it is a good thing that the general public didn't know about her affair with Lou. Yeah. Because being involved How with a great man. How do you keep that secret? I don't know. But if you're when you're involved with a great man, it always has a ten tendency to overshadow you if you're a female. So now I'm sure you're asking where was Khan's wife? Esther and yeah. all this. Yes. Well, lest you feel too bad for her, she was having an affair of her own with another scientist. Oh. According to Wendy Lesser, who oh. wrote You Say Brick. Yes. So, basically, it was you their average marriage mm -hmm. in the 1950s and 60s. Yep. <laughs> it was a Mad Men relationship. Right. Uh, it was just the status quo. Uh, clearly, there was an amount of love there and loyalty to some extent, but I think work was Lou's first mistress. And his real mistresses were an extension of that, as he seemed to always have affairs with women that were working with him. In the end, Lou said it best himself that work should be everything because human relationships were too unpredictable. And speaking of work, Kahn designed the Richards Medical Building at University of Pennsylvania in 1957, though it was not completed until 1963. And in 1959, he began the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, which would become one of his more iconic works. Before I go into the architectural details and description of the the Salk Institute buildings as well as the architectural process that created them, I have been to the Salk, uh, which is why I just decided to discuss that as opposed to the Yale Art Gallery, which I studied in undergrad, or the Exeter Library, or the Kimball, which looks incredible, but I've never been. So Khan's work is a study in geometry and materials and just solid architecture stuff that you learn in school. Solid architecture, literally and, and figuratively, you know, materials and just like solid, you know, that is solid design. Um, but I think that, I think there's an existential element to any of his buildings that you don't understand that you can't understand unless you visit his designs in person and just watching the segment on of my architect that's on the sock makes me realize that I, I only experienced a fraction of the, the beingness of the building because I was there, you know, on a bright, beautiful, clear afternoon, the movie, there's a time, there's a time lapse scene of, it from morning till night and I only saw it you know a, a wedge of the clock if you will and in order to fully experience that building and really any other 
And I and I think Hans buildings, you think about it even more than Wright's buildings or Meyer or Gary or, you know, other kind of stark attacks as it, it's a different building every time of day. And I know that's true for falling water or whatever, but there's something about the way that Khan designs that the buildings absorb their surroundings and they Why? they become like, something else. It seems that light played a really big right. They were yeah, it was it was pretty amazing. Right. But they showed some interior shots of what he did and how the light affected it. Isn't it's really like he didn't use a lot of windows. A lot of his buildings are just like Concrete. block walls. Sure. Yeah. But the way but that he was skylights. Yeah. Kind of the way that he was able to bring light in, like with the Kimball, which is, you know, solid walls, but there's this and I know we're not talking about it, but there's this vaulting system that I mean it's it's all con- concrete, but but it reads um, you know, it reads silver and it reads stone and it reads granite. And there was, I think there was something in the book that said concrete really wants to be granite or something. And yeah. But of anyone, he, he could do that. He could make concrete granite. And, um, so in, anyway, it, if you look at pictures, I mean, it's, it's great to look at pictures and they're this, they're just so beautiful. Like if you look up, cause the Salk was recently, um, restored uh thanks to a getty grant they finished restoration i think last year but um so there's some really amazing professional shots that were done but it's one thing to see those and another thing to experience it um but somewhere somewhere in the past few days of my research i read that that louis Kahn prepared for five decades to achieve what he did in two what most people can only hope to achieve in five his most lasting contributions to the architectural canon happened towards the end of his life, including the Salk. A friend of Jonas Salk saw Khan speak at a symposium in 1959. So remember, I say the end of his life. And Khan was born in 1901. And here it is, 1959. And he hasn't even begun the buildings that he's I for. believe he's most known for. Yeah. So this is 1959. Late bloomer. What did he's I tell 58. you? He's 58. And he gave a talk in Pittsburgh called Order in Science and Art. There's a building that was under construction at the time at Penn um, in Philly called the Richards Medical Research Building. So Jonas Salk was looking to build an institute for biological research in California. And he, so his friend, the one who saw Khan, told Salk. And Salk was curious about this man that he did not have the opportunity to hear speak. So he stopped at his, um, at Khan's Philadelphia office on the way to New York. Instead of asking Khan how to go about finding an architect, which is the plan, he realized he had already found the right one. Khan gave Salk a tour of the Richards medical building and (laughs) the book, you say to brick says that Salk was much more impressed by Khan than The Richards Medical Building, um, which is not terribly attractive. And but he saw he saw potential and he really liked Lou Kahn, perhaps as an extension of the science and art talk that Kahn had given at the Pittsburgh Symposium. Salk and Kahn enjoyed having philosophical talks about humanity. In fact, their deep conversations, not a written scope, was what led to the first design of the Salk Institute. And I, I like that it that each of the men had different had something different to bring to the table but it reflects my my very deep-seated belief that no matter what discipline you come from you can always have common ground you know intelligent people like whether you're a linguist or an artist or a mathematician like you can always find common ground um and that's I, i think that's what made this collaboration so successful is that the the client and the architect were so bonded and they had these incredible conversations. It was their respective intelligence that fostered a collaboration rarely seen between a client and architect and certainly those of such disparate disciplines. It was not only their words, but historical precedent that inspired the architecture of the new Institute. Jonas Salk had visited a monastery in Assisi in 1954 
and the arcades, columns, and courtyard of its cloister inspired his vision of the design. Khan had visited Assisi in 1929 while on his own grand tour of Europe and had made sketches of the local church buildings and arcades. So they're seeing the same things and they're inspired by the same things. The city of San Diego suggested a few locations for Salk's new facility and Salk selected a beautiful site on the Torrey Pines property in La Jolla. The men visited the site for the first time in 1960, and the land officially became the property of Salk in April of that year. Kahn's preliminary sketches defined three building types to be components of the design, a meeting hall, laboratories, and residences. His first design borrowed from the Richards in Philadelphia, but as the program became more clearly defined, so did the design. A second version was established in April of 1961 after about a year of additional design development. Over the course of the last quarter of 1961 through the spring of 1962, the second design was refined and a contract signed. Upon further study, however, that design was to evolve again. Khan had designed two central garden spaces, each bordered by two laboratory buildings, and established a structural system of folded plates in which the various services like electrical and heating, ventilation, and air conditioning could run. So a more, a more poetic way to explain the relationship between the structure and the services are that they are the served and servant spaces. Drawing a comparison to a metaphor that came from, Salk, from Jonas Salk himself, One serves the body, and one is the body itself. From the architecture standpoint, Kahn realized, however, that creating two central spaces with respective buildings might not foster unity between the areas, and that although practical, the structural system was not flexible. It would limit the interior laboratories to 10-foot modules. In June of 1962, Kahn presented Salk the third and final version of the lab complex, with the concepts established in the second design finding a more harmonious application. These concepts were the separation of studies and laboratories, the interrelation of servant and served spaces, the idea of one central garden, east-facing service spaces, so away from the ocean, and west-facing administrative offices and library. Additionally, a revised structural design allowed for more flexibility within the lab spaces. Expressed on the facade is the structure itself. The edges of the walls and the floors are all visible. The story of the building is in its materials. Within the grid of concrete and between the angled concrete fins extending from each tower are the panels of are panels of untreated teak that weathered with age. The panels each are equipped with three sliding window components: a window, a screen, and a louvered shade. So you could make your choice whether you wanted all the light, some of the light, just the breeze. And there's, you know, there's different tracks. So you can have any combination of that. And it looks really cool. Khan understood the importance of the color of the concrete and admixtures. That's stuff that you put in concrete to get different colors or different properties. uh, Were blended with the material to give it a warmer hue. So it was very... um, specific uh it was a very specific color that he he gave it that's not you know not your everyday concrete you can see the imprint of the formwork on the walls and the round mark where the plywood forms were connected everything about the building is honest and everything works in harmony with itself and with the surroundings although the construction of the buildings was substantially complete in 1965 Khan had not yet settled on a design for the courtyard Where now instead of four buildings and two gardens, there were now two buildings that shared a central plaza. Two gardens had been easier for him to design than one large court. Instead of a garden, the area to Khan was more symbolic, and he asked famous Mexican architect Louis Barragan to consult on the design. When Barragan finally made it to La Jolla in February of 1966, he found a field of mud between two essentially complete structures. Barragan told Khan that under no circumstances should anything be planted in the space. Khan himself had said, quote, the surface is a facade that rises to the sky and unites the two as if everything else had been hollowed out. 
So I think he knew all along the right thing to do, but um, Baragon, the landscape architect genius he was, was able to sort of 